Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. As, uh, as Rafe mentioned, I am, uh, my name is Noah Chung, and I am the Near South Church Planting Associate Pastor here in South Loop, but also in the Bridgeport neighborhood. And as he mentioned, too, if you have a church planting bug or are excited about going somewhere else and new and challenging, talk to me. Talk to me. You know, get coffee or lunch or something like that. I love to talk about it as seeing what God is stirring in our hearts to see what other neighborhoods that he wants to see gospel-centered churches throughout our city. And so excited about that. Um, if you've been new with us, we're in Romans. We're going through Romans, the whole book of Romans, and we're right in the middle in chapter 8. So turn to Romans 8, verses 18 through 30. Uh, I believe in your Bibles it's 944 or somewhere near there. Um, and just a kind of quick recap of Romans 8. Uh, two weeks ago, Kenson preached on Romans 8 and how after all of Paul was talking about how we are saved through faith or grace and how Christ has saved us and we are free from the slavery of sin, that now there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ. And not only that, we have the Spirit of God in us as a down payment for Christ's work in us. And then as Rafe preached last week, that as the Spirit is in us, we are not only have that, but that we are also adopted, legally adopted into God's own family. And as adopted children of God, we are co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs with Christ. But then, interestingly though, as we kind of go to our section today, verse 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about suffering today. Um, it's not a popular topic, but I think it's a topic that all of us need to be reminded of daily. And so let me read our text for today and pray, and then we'll dig right in. So Romans 8, starting from verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who was subjected in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it patient, with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Let me pray. God, we thank you for your word this morning. It's, it's, it's a lot. And, and God, as even I've been just wrestling through this text, just, uh, it's been a journey for sure, God. It's been frustrating. It's been confusing. But also it's super clear, I believe, in what you want to say to us through your word. And so, God, I pray that you may open up our hearts, allow all distractions, all things that are bothering us to be thrown away, and so that we can focus on your word and what your spirit is trying to speak to us, God. And I pray that whatever words that are coming out of my mouth that are not of you, that they may just be forgotten, but that what you want to say to us, that it may stick, that it may grow deep into our hearts, grow roots, and bear much, much fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, uh, I grew up in the Korean church, and one of the um, amazing things about the Korean church is that uh, it's, it's the title, it's in Korean, it's called Chipsanim, which means uh, technically in English, like deacon. But in the Korean church, a Chipsanim was not some, like, I mean, they were a deacon, of course, but they're not just standard deacon. They were like the OGs of deacons, okay? They, they were people who committed themselves and were doing so many things in the church. For example, um, the 
the deacons of the Chips and Chips and Churches, they would be going to church, but they would not just be going to church on Sundays or Wednesdays for uh, Bible night studies, but they would be going to do many things and serving and loving the church. They would be in the backgrounds. They would be cooking the meals for Sundays. They would be visiting homes to, to love on those who are sick and praying for them. They would come every morning to pray for the church and the people. They would be willing to drive people around who couldn't drive around for those who are elderly. And there were many, many more things that they would be doing. But they would never be seen on stage. And as they would go, as, these, as, the, as the deacons, as the chitanims, they would continue to do this without any acknowledgement or praise from others. But they were always working behind the scenes. And I've seen it very clearly. When someone is suffering, when someone is going through a hard time or they're in the hospital, the first, pers- the first people to pray, to go visit them, to bring them meals were the chitanims. But... For many, we didn't know who they were. We just knew, we didn't even know their names. We just called them chitsanim. That's all we called them, deacon or deaconesses. And when I think about these chitsanims and kind of growing up and just really just thankful for their work, I, I begin to realize that they are doing so much behind the scenes, so much for God and his work in his church. And I realize that as we're getting into this topic of suffering, that as we read this, Paul, I believe, he's reminding us that God is working behind the scenes much more than we realize when we are suffering. That though suffering, I'm not trying to downplay suffering, I'm sure that in the room this size, the amount of things that you have experienced or, or people have done to you is just immense, but that God is working amidst our suffering. As children of God, God is doing much more than we realize And so I have basically just three ways that God is encouraging us amidst our suffering. And the first one, as we see in our text in verse 18, is that God is using your suffering to reveal the glory that is to come. God is using our suffering to reveal the glory that is to come. And if we just go to verse 18, I'm going to kind of go through like a lot of these verses here because they're super jam-packed. Verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now, if you know anything about Paul's story, Paul, what he went through in his apostleship, suffering was no joke for him. If you, if you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he talks about how he's been thrown in prison, how he's been beaten multiple times, shipwrecked. He's received the 40 lashes minus one. He's been beat, bruised, just mocked and just ridiculed. And he has the pressure of the church that he's trying to plant, but he is going through so much. And so he has that, that suffering in one hand. And then he sees glory. Glory, that Jesus Christ will come again, that he will restore all things on earth. And he sees that on the other hand. And it's no comparison. He says that they are not even worth comparing. It's like comparing like a lump of coal to like a trillion ton diamond. It's not worth comparing according to Paul. But then why? Why is it not worth comparing for Paul? Well, he begins to explain throughout verses 19 through 25. And he shows that two things are groaning and waiting. And the first thing he shows in verse 19 is that for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And if we jump down to verse 22, he says, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. When Paul says that creation waits with eager longing, it's like this image of someone craning their neck, like trying to see if this thing's coming or not. They're constantly looking back and seeing if it's coming. And this word groaning, it, it means groaning. It means groaning intensely. And he compares it to childbirth. And I don't know if you guys um, are mother, mothers here or, you know, fathers seeing their wives or just know anything about childbirth. But it, that in itself is no joke. It's long. It's painful. It's kind of, it's kind of, it's beautiful, yes, but it's kind of gross. It's a, you know, don't want to get too much in the detail there. It's, it's gross. There's just so much groaning in that um, such circumstance. And I remember even, too, when my wife gave uh, birth, and um, it, it was the first, for our firstborn, Matthias, it took, it took 40 hours for labor, which was insane in itself. 
And, but what, what was amazing was that, or kind of just scary, was throughout all the other rooms next to us, the groaning, the, the longing of just waiting for the suffering to end. It's just immense. And in that same way, Paul is saying creation is groaning in that same way. It's eagerly waiting for God to reveal his purpose, his glory. And what they're waiting for is what we see in verse 20 and 21. For the creation was subjected to futility, which literally means that they're in this constant state of frustration. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage of corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. What they are longing for is that they are longing to be just freed and restored from all the decay and the death and the brokenness on this earth. Right, we know that if we look at creation, it's beautiful, right? But when we also see creation, it's a very dark picture as well. There's death, there's decay, there's just, and also not even counting like the, what humanity has done to earth, but there's pollution, there's trash, there's animals that are killing each other. It's just a gruesome and dark kind of picture. And they're awaiting for themselves to be free. And if you look back in Genesis 3, it talks about how when God cursed Adam and Eve, that he didn't just curse Adam and Eve, he cursed the very ground that they would live on, that there would be thorns and thistles, and that death would reign throughout the earth. But then also we see in verse 23 that not only creation, but we, we ourselves, we, have, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit. So when he says that here, he's saying that we, it's not all of humanity, it's those who have the Spirit in them. We too are groaning inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. We too, because we know that Christ is coming again, that he will restore all things on earth, that he will restore our bodies even, we are waiting for that time. We have that hope. But we are now in this period because suffering, yeah, suffering reigns. Death and sin continue to do just damage upon this earth. And we know that. Excuse me. And so for us, Paul is saying that suffering is here, that we are groaning, that creation is groaning. But a question that I have for you then is what are you groaning for? What are you groaning for? What are you eagerly awaiting? Is it, is it that for God's glory to be revealed? Is that what you are honestly, eagerly waiting for? Because for Paul, creation is eagerly waiting for God's glory to be revealed. But are we waiting for that same thing? You know, I, I think for us, a lot of us, when we think of um, waiting, uh, that's not a very common thing, I feel like, in our society. For example, um, I don't know if you all have noticed, but if you have Amazon Prime, uh, they move from two-day free shipping to one-day free shipping. I had no idea, so I looked it up. It happened, like, at June of last year. And so now, you can literally buy anything or whatever you need, and most likely, it will get to your doorstep in about one day. And, and not only that, but there are a lot of things that we can get instantaneously. We can rent movies online and immediately watch them. We can do our taxes online and not have to go to account and kind of do it really, really quickly. We can even, you know, buy food, get, get deliveries to us. You know, Amazon also has this thing called Amazon Fresh or whatever, and you can put in your grocery list, and under like two hours or so, they promise to deliver you your groceries. I mean, everything is just immediate for us. It's just kind of like a microwave. We want it in two minutes or less. But when we think about suffering, when we think about waiting, about groaning, I feel like a lot of us, and even myself, I, I feel it all the time, we love the immediate over the ultimate. We love what's immediate. We, we want things now. We don't want to wait to have that dream vacation we would want it now. We don't want to wait to, um, you know, graduate from school or from get that new job or that new title or that new paycheck. We want that right now. We don't want to wait to uh, get married. We want to have sex. We want to have that intimacy right now. 
There are so many things that we desire right now. But for God and the way that he works, there is a bigger picture. There is the ultimate that he wants us to see. Not the immediate. Because we all know that when we go constantly for the immediate, just like a microwave meal, it won't satisfy what we long for. It may fill us for a little bit, but we're going to be hungry and wanting for more. And, you know, I I think C.S. Lewis actually says this really well in his book, um, The Weight of Glory. And let me just quote him here. He says this is a very common and popular quote. But he says, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at, at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We are far too easily pleased. We want the immediate over the ultimate. But as we see, Paul is saying, that all the sufferings that we have now and all of it that we wanted to see relieved or for God to answer these things, it does not compare to the glory that Christ has promised for us. And Paul is reminding of, that, my reminding of us that in here, right here. But then for us, as many of us, maybe some of us, are in this room and we're in a midst or a season of suffering right now, that we're questioning, like, God, why are you doing this right now? Why are... Why is my body breaking? Or why is my friend or my family member suffering? Or God, why? How do I get through this period of time? And I, I believe Paul continues to remind us that God is still working. And one of the ways that God works, and the second point that I have, is that God says, you are not alone. You, as my child, are not alone. I am helping you in your weakness. I am helping you in your weakness. And so as we see in verse 26 to 27, let me just read it over again. It says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You know, when we see in our text here, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, the weakness is not just any, like, ailment that we have. This weakness is when our backs are against the wall and we have literally no option and we don't know what to do. And when the Spirit says he's helping us, it's not like he's helping by giving some armchair advice or being a fan and cheering us on. The Spirit enters and wants to roll up his sleeves and get into that suffering with us. That's the help that he's offering. And the main way that he offers that help to all of us is through intercession. And intercession is when someone else is praying on behalf of another. And interestingly, as we see here, the Spirit is actually, uh, if we look, the Spirit is groaning too deep for words. It's interesting that as creation groans amidst suffering and as we groan amidst suffering, the Spirit groans, but he groans on behalf of our suffering. The Spirit is interceding on behalf of us. And also, what we have to see here is that the Spirit is the perfect intercessor. I know that when we, as for our deacons or when you're praying for others, that when we pray, we're really praying like, God, if it's in your will, let it be done. But when the Spirit prays, he is in perfect mediation and relationship with God our Father and with us. And as we see in verse 28, I mean, verse 27, that he, he who searches hearts, He knows the deepest, innermost beings of our hearts. But he also knows the will of God, the perfect will of God. So when he intercedes on behalf of us, when we need strength, he prays for strength. When we need comfort, he prays for comfort. When we need help, when we need a friend, when we need God to help us in that, even if we don't know what we need, the Spirit is praying on behalf of us. Paul is reminding us of this. And, you know, um, as, like, a pastor, you try to figure out, like, okay, like, how do I, like, illustrate this? And the spirit groaning for us, I'm like, gosh, that, that's, like, a hard thing. To, I don't know how that even works. I, I don't know, like, really how the spirit groans on behalf of us. I mean, you may know a little better, but I, like, tried to think about what's a good way to kind of explain this for us. And I began to ask, like, I, I really don't know. And so then I asked the question, like, when has the spirit groaned 
on my behalf. And uh, it kind of it, it kind of brought me back actually to about seven years ago. Um, my uh, I remember this moment very clearly. I was sitting in uh, my like my like my parents' home in the living room with my brother and I, and we were sitting across from our dad. Our mom had gone for an errand, and um, in, like two months ago, my dad was uh, diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer, and pretty much like he was on his last thread. Um, and the, our history is very long, but my brother and I, we also had a very kind of difficult relationship with our dad. He, you know, a lot of just, a lot of frustrations at work, but also like a lot of alcoholism has really kind of like made a lot of just pain and suffering within our family. And so honestly, like in that period of time, like my brother and I, we really did not like our dad. We, I mean, at points I would say we kind of hated our dad. But at that moment for, for God probably, we decided to pray for our dad. Um, and I, I remember we were praying for his healing because God could only, the only way that he would be healed is that God would heal him. And I remember there were not many words said in that moment. There were a lot of groaning for sure. There was a lot of tears, probably more tears than I or my brother and my dad ever had together. Um, and we just groaned for like 30 minutes. Um, and... You know, I would love to say, I mean, we prayed, and it was good, and it ended, and, you know, we kind of, you know, went, talked a little bit and, and hugged each other and went on our ways. Um, and I would love to tell you that after that prayer that God healed my dad, but he passed away actually a week after that moment. And as, and as I, like, reflected upon that moment seven years now, I realized that, man, at that moment, we were asking for God to heal our dad. But... I feel like at that moment, the Holy Spirit was actually groaning on our behalf for God to heal my, brother and my, my brother's heart and my own heart on behalf of my dad. And Because at, at that moment, our tears weren't tears of like anger or bitterness. They were, tear, they, were, they were tears of empathy and of sadness and of our desire for our, our, our dad to be healed. And the Holy Spirit was praying that God would heal our hearts, that heal my brother's hearts. And I believe God actually did that. He did that at that moment, and he continued to do that before he, my dad passed away. And at that moment, too, I believe the Spirit was actually praying that God would save my dad as well, that he would trust in Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he actually did that like four or five days before he passed away. When the Spirit intercedes on behalf of us, it, it might not be what we think it, it should be. But he groans because he knows the perfect will of God. And he also knows our hearts and what we truly need. And he intercedes for us. But again, it's when we are in our weakest and lowest moments, when we need him, the Spirit will intercede on behalf of us. And so as we, we, we you know, we... We kind, of, we, we kind of think that as we do this that we know the answers to our suffering. You know, the common thing that we think is that we know what will fix our suffering. But in reality, the Spirit, only God knows what we really need to hear. Um, and as we continue on, I want to kind of, kind of continue and finish on with this uh, last part of our passage here. And the, the third thing that I believe God is working amidst our suffering, that how God is working amidst our suffering, is that in verse 28 we see that God is working all things for his good. And when we say, what, what is good then? For God, what is good? Because honestly, I, I've heard this passage or this, this verse kind of used out of context a lot. It's used for our good. God is always working for those who love him for, for our good. But in actuality, the good that Paul is describing here is not our good. It's not what you think is good. It's not what the world thinks is good. But in actuality, it's what God believes is good. And the good that he is mapping out for us is his eternal and redemptive plan for all of his children. What is the ultimate good and the ultimate purpose that Paul is looking for? And it's found in verse 9, that he whom he foreknew he also predestined for all his children to be conformed to the image of his son. That is his ultimate good. That is his goal in all of us. As his children, he wants us to become more like his son, Jesus Christ. And I know for us, that's not like what we think we need, especially in our suffering. But what God is saying is that just as when Christ, and if you guys, 
and, and Bridgeport, we're actually doing um, a Lenten kind of New Testament challenge. We're reading through all of the New Testament, and you kind of read chunks of the gospel, and we've been going through that. And as we read chunks of the gospel, just, I, 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 I'm just amazed by how much Jesus suffers, that he's mocked, that he's unjustly arrested, that he's whipped, beaten, he's, his friends abandon him, and of course that he dies on the cross for our sins. And for God, he wants us to be conformed into the image of Christ, so then suffering then is required if we are to be like Christ. That is a promise and a guarantee for Christ followers, that if you decide to follow Jesus, to become like him, suffering will happen. Suffering will happen. And then I know that as we think about this passage and as, as God is trying to conform in us, I know the question that we're asking is, is that, you know, I don't want to be in suffering. I want to avoid it. I want to protect and build walls so I will never suffer. And for us, we do our best to get out of suffering. We create many different ways to get out of suffering. And for, for us, like, we think that we have the power to do it. I think, honestly, a lie in the American just community, but also in the American church, is that you can get yourself out of suffering. You can do it. That's the lie that we hear all the time. But for Jesus, what, what God, what Paul is saying is that you cannot get yourself out of that suffering. It's impossible. We, we've tried before. We've tried to create so many things before. But for God, he's saying, like, don't try to get out of my suffering what he is saying, and as we see in verse 30, uh, theologians and scholars call this kind of the golden chain, is that God is working in us. And as we see this kind of chain, you see, it behind, you see the kind of the, the chain behind me is that God, it is God who predestined us before the creation of the world. It is God who called us into relationship with him. It is God who justifies us through the blood of Jesus Christ who saves us and his justice is given, his righteousness is given to us. And I'll add one more. It is God who sanctifies us, who makes us holy to become more like Christ. And then it is also God who will glorify us in our, in our, in our dead bodies to be new created heavenly bodies and to live in eternity with him in the home that is so glorious and so good. It is God who is working. We ourselves cannot get out of our suffering. You can try. The world says to keep trying, but it just won't work. God is saying, I am conforming my, my son in you. And I, I feel like for a lot of us, we, we kind of have this picture in mind. And so if you go to the next slide, um, the, this picture, um, can you make out that picture for me? Anyone see that? You see like that tiny little dot over there on the right? I f can you make that, can you see what that is? Probably not, right? None of us can make that out, right? But go to the next slide. I, I feel like it's, it's very simple, but I feel like a lot of us are just like that. We have our minds and our sufferings and our lives just, just so myopic and like laser focused on that one thing. And that's actually a person right there. And we're just focused on me. But then what God has in his eternal plan, his good plan, it's amazing. It's so good. And he promises that, yes, there's suffering, but as Paul said, that it does not compare to the glory that is to come. That when we get to see Christ face to face, when we can say, Jesus, well good, he says to us, well done, my, my good and faithful servant. It is so good to see. And so for so much of us, I, I feel like we, we need to just expand our viewpoints. We need to stop looking at the opposite end of the telescope and look at kind of what God has in store for us. And, you know, to be honest, as I like have been, and the reason why I like just wrestled through this sermon so much, and, you know, I can tell Rafe, I told Rafe and Kenson, I have like, I don't know what I'm going to preach about really. Because I know the text, but like it's just like what is the Holy Spirit doing in us? And, and, like, as a pastor, like, and just knowing, like, the sufferings that have gone on in this room, the sufferings that have gone on in, like, my own life and my family, like, it's hard. Like, it's like, we don't want to, we don't want to discredit that. We don't want to discredit the, the, the real, the painful, it's almost like, like the unfairness that we feel in our suffering. And, you know, I know that so many times as a as churches and as, you know, as the American church, I feel like we, we want to avoid that topic. But at Park here, we want to embrace it. 
We want to embrace the, the humanity and the, the brokenness that we feel. But just like Jesus, as Rafe just did the call to worship, we want to be alongside with you in that. And I, I just, I don't, I don't, I, I can't imagine what you all have been, have gone through or what are going through right now. Um, and I don't know, like, what, and I don't think Rafe knows. I don't think God, I don't think Kenson knows. I don't think any of us really fully know what God is doing. You know, if you look back at Job, God doesn't answer why he's suffering. God just reveals who he is. And for us, God reveals his eternal and redemptive plan in Scripture. And I know for us, that, it may not feel like enough. But for all of us, that's the only hope. It's the only thing that we can trust into as God's people. Because remember, amidst the suffering that you are enduring, whether it's now or whether it's to come, God is saying to us, his children, he's saying to you as, as his daughter, as his son, I am working amidst your suffering. I am working. I am, I am preparing a home for you. I am preparing glory for you. I, am, I have sent my Holy Spirit to intercede on behalf of you, to help you in your weakness. And I am conforming you to the image of Christ, to the beautiful, perfect image of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let me just close with this. Um, last, last month was Black History Month, and um, you know, I, was, I was thinking about um, just one of the, the well-known, I guess as Black History Month passed, um, one of the most beautiful things about African American history is um, the, the writing or the oral tradition of Negro spirituals. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but um, basically throughout um, the people who um, were, were captured, were enslaved, and brought over by the millions, and who lost their families, who were stripped of their culture, who were just unjustly beaten and, and, and treated, um, kind of in a, a, God, a miraculous way, God saved many of them with the same gospel that saves us today. And through the pain and the suffering where hope just didn't seem anywhere near their lives, they, what the slave masters couldn't take away was their music, was the, was the music. And as they wrote these songs, these songs convey the utmost utter pain of humanity, but the deep hope that comes with glory that is to come. And, you know, I, I'm personally not, like, any expert on that. But as I just reflected upon that, like, if our brothers and sisters in Christ who suffered hundreds of years ago during that time, hundreds of years ago during that time, and they could write these songs of hope amidst their pain, I, I feel like for us, this, in the same way, music is one way that we are able to endure, to persevere, and to have a picture of the glory to come. Music is just one way where I feel like the Spirit moves in us to encourage us and remind us that glory is coming. And one of the most well-known um, Negro spirituals is actually this song, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. It's actually a song that looks at the picture of Elijah when, he, when, he, when, when the, the, the horses on fire, the chariots of fire came and swept them across and brought them to heaven. It's this picture that amidst the lowest of lows of our suffering, there is hope that those chariots will take me home as well. So let me just read this uh, song to you. Uh, I won't sing it. I'll, just, I'll spare you from that. Uh, I'll read it, and um, I'll pray, okay? It says, it says, swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? A band of angels coming after me. If you get there before I do, tell all my friends that I'm coming to, coming forth to carry me home. Let me pray. And, and actually, as, as I pray, um, if you don't mind, actually, I'm, I'm going to read a, a, um, a, a short liturgical prayer on, on behalf of us. I can't read the whole thing, but... Um, if you don't mind, if you're open to it, actually just, um, if you're going through a particular suffering, um, put your hands open. Lay your hands open, your palms face up, and just receive this prayer um, that I believe will speak to us. There is so much lost in this world, O Lord, so much that aches and groans and shivers for want of redemption, so much that seems dislocated, upended, desecrated, unhinged, even in our own hearts. 
Even in our own hearts, we bear the mark of all that is broken. What is best in this world has been bashed and battered and trodden down. What was meant to be the substance has become the brittle shell haunted by the ghost of a glory so long crumbled that only its rubble is, ru is, rubble is remembered now. Now, O oh Lord, let our tears, our sufferings, the things that we have gone through, anoint these broken things. Let our grief be as their consecration, a preparation for their promised redemption, our sorrow sealing them for that day when you will take the ache of all creation and turn it inside out like the shedding of an old gardener's glove. O oh Lord, if it pleases you when your children weep and don't know why, yet use our tears to baptize what you love. It's in your mercy, Lord. Hear our prayers. Amen.